Um, I was just, you know, having known her for 20 something years. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September 19, 2018, regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Call the meeting to order, and if you would all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Present. Uh, general public comments. Uh, we have a guest speaker from Westbrook here today, Dan Glover, to uh, speak to us about the Archangel program that probably not a lot of people uh, listening in tonight or in the audience are familiar with. So, Dan, thank you for coming, and we look forward to learning more about the Thank program. you. Thank you very much. And you find uh, on your desk a pin, and if you don't recognize it, it is a Russian-American flag pin for your lapel. My name is Dan Glover. I live at 90 Strawwater Street in Westbrook, and I am a member of the Greater Portland Archangel Committee. Back in November of 1988, uh, Mayor Philip D. Spiller, also of Westbrook, on behalf of the Greater Portland Region, signed an agreement in Archangel Russia that the Greater Portland Region, Maine, would be, become a sister city to the city of Archangel Russia. Chair, your then council chairman, Dr. George E. Roy, on behalf of Scarborough and other representatives of the region, countersigned the agreement in April of 1989 in the state of Maine room in Portland. We thank Scarborough for its support for the relationship and involvement in various exchanges over the years. And we have had many successful exchanges involving many parts of our communities, including high school students, the State Department of Transportation, the University of Southern Maine, judges and lawyers, and most recently, local fire departments and state forestry agencies were involved in exchanges over the last couple of years. Even though in 1988 it seemed a difficult time for such a relationship to be established, it was in fact the will of the Greater Portland Region to make the effort to engage the Russian peoples. Today, it seems no less difficult a time as we celebrate 30 years of partnership. Tonight, we want to make the people of <coughs> Scarborough avail aware and we ask you to participate in what we are calling the Bridges of Friendship Photography Exchange. An exhibit will be held at the Stonewall Gallery in Yarmouth, Maine, simultaneous to an exhibition to be held in Archangel Russia during the same time frame. The patronage support request, which I have here and have been distributed to you, uh, reads in part as follows. This November is the 30th anniversary of the Sister City relationship between Greater Portland, Maine and Archangel Russia. There is a wonderful opportunity for the 14 municipalities in the Greater Portland area to support a photographic cultural exchange between the Portland Camera Club of Maine and the Spalaki Photo Club from Archangel Russia. We are seeking $150 from each municipality to help bring 30 pair, that's 60 photographs of images both, from both countries to be recognized by the Bridges of Friendship Photography Exhibit. This exhibit will provide a unique opportunity for the residents of the Greater Portland Region to see a jury show of outstanding <coughs> photographs from each country side by side. We hope you will find this exhibit valuable to your community and worthy of your support. Uh, you can find updates and they will be eventually posted on the Portland Camera Club website at portlandcameraclub.org and we will work with your chairman, Donovan, and ask who, might, who on the council might be our contact person to update Scarborough as Archangel-related events unfold this fall and into next year. Thank you. I, I was going to bring a picture along. I was supposed to bring a picture along to show you this picture, but there is a picture on the flyer that shows, it's called Bridge on Bridge. Between Bridges is what the name of it is, and that's a photographer. Photogra a photograph that was done by the Russians, and on the other side of the flyer is a picture, a scene, a winter scene, winter scene of a river. That's the Royal River in Yarmouth, where the exhibition will be held. So we appreciate your support and participation. 
Dan, tell us a little bit about uh, going town to town and how many communities are involved uh, in this program and, and uh, what your uh, success rate has been in having communities become involved. Well, originally, uh, back in 1984, uh, when I started working on the relationship, the, 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 the effort, there were six communities paired between the United States and the Soviet Union. And um, the only way the, uh, uh, the Association for Relations between Soviet and Foreign Cities and Sister Cities International, the only way they would pair up a community is if they were of 200,000 people or more. That's the only way they would formally recognize a parent. So I was working with someone in South Portland, and people, the Peace, Portland Peace Committee was in, involved in Portland. Anyhow, we organized the Greater Portland region to be 200,000 people. At that time, there were 11, eight, eight towns and three cities, and since then, three towns have joined. So there are 14 in our definition of Greater Portland. Which, which is enough if you, uh, if you have to go out and visit them all, it's a, it's a task. So, but uh, that's where it started and why it's 14 communities. And we've had just various exchanges over the years. The first 10 years were definitely the most active, but still it's a vibrant relationship and many people come back and forth all the time. How many of the towns, uh, of these 14 towns, have you been able to visit? And Make so far, making this pitch? Yes. I think we're on number 10 right now, and the others are, are lined up. <coughs> and uh, we, we, so Westbrook is already in, and Wyndham, and Freeport, and somebody else. But every, there's a little bit of a different process with every town. It's $150, not a lot of money, but it's not in the budget. And so we leave it to you to come up with it. Actually, I think one of the cities just took up a collection from the council and gave us $150, but it's more we want to see the communities involved in the project as a 30-year anniversary. That's that's what we're talking about. So there's about a half a dozen communities so far have yes. uh, committed themselves. Yeah, and I, I, I feel fairly confident that the rest of them will follow. Who will follow. Yeah. Uh, any questions uh, for Dan? Chris. So, Dan, I was actually a Portland High School graduate of 1988, and oh, really? I recall this program when it first kicked off. Okay. Um, I also happened to participate in the 1989 Maine Maritime Cruise to Leningrad, oh. which was one of the, um, I don't know if it was a direct result of this, but at the time it was uh, certainly seen as an opportunity to, to bridge relationships. So I think it's a, definitely a worthwhile uh, endeavor, and certainly if, if, uh, if, if there isn't any money in the budget, I'd be happy to contribute to the collection to take it up, because I do think it's a... It's worthwhile to keep those relationships open, and and, and uh, I recall a very warm welcome, a surprisingly warm welcome uh, for us in, in Leningrad at the time. It was one of their first exposures to to Westerners, and just the genuine um, appreciation and 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 welcomeness of of the community. And I actually had the opportunity to go back about. 20 years later for business, a uh, completely different city. <laughs> now it's been westernized. But, but the point is the cultural exchanges, I think, do matter. Um, as crazy as things get on the political scene, uh, it's those cultural exchanges, I think, that, that, that make a big impact. So I, I'm happy to contribute if we take up a collection. Any uh, other comments, uh, questions for Dan? Uh, uh, certainly, I, I think probably uh, without uh, uh, objection, I would uh, uh, propose that we take $150 out of our contingency fund, which is there for these sort of unbudgeted items. We have a little, it's not a large fund, but uh, this sounds like uh, $150 well spent. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Anyone uh, wishing to make public comments uh, on anything not on the agenda for tonight, please approach the podium. Hi, my name's uh, Bradley Abbott, owner of uh, three different commercial properties in town, four Washington, 25 Washington, three commercial road. Um, just want to talk again, I spoke a couple weeks ago about uh, the tax valuations and they've since last night they uh, were released on your website. Um, just want you guys to understand there was an average of 44% tax increase that went up this year across the board. Um, that's due in, in under 30 days. It's a very large burden for the businesses in town that function on long-term projections to have that short of notice. Um, I feel that something should have been done to help us, you know, 
bridge this gap so we knew this was coming better, could prepare, and I didn't have to, you know, deal with tenants that are now screaming at me uh, about having to get back and collect back taxes because of the short notice given to me by the town and, and the way the process was done. Um, the second thing that's kind of concerning is after going through the public records, there's roughly $300 million worth of evaluation gain in our commercial sector that, from the old evaluations to the new ones. Um, going off the current mill rate, that's roughly $5 million in revenue gain for the town based on that tax value. Uh, the biggest problem I have with that is going from your website, a re-evaluation is a revenue neutral and simply a redistribution of the tax burden. It's not supposed to be put out there to gain more taxes for the town. It's supposed to be a redistribution. So I'm kind of asking today what's happening with that $5 million that you're gaining from the commercial side. Are we going to see that as a change in the mill rate? Is it going to be spread back out in a certain fashion? Because we're now taxing the commercial side more heavily, which is fine. It's probably the appropriate thing given real estate values. But something needs to be offset. This isn't just tax the commercial side to fund the budget. There needs to be a reevaluation. And you should, we should be seeing with that extra $5 million a change in the mill rate across the board. And it's very concerning that the numbers don't seem to add up with the budgets and where this evaluation is coming in and our current mill rate is still going up. So that's my. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to speak to the gentleman's comments. Uh, anyone who has been watching the municipal affairs this past year has known for a long time that uh, we had determined the industrial commercial side of our tax base to be dramatically undervalued uh, to the detriment of the residential side. Uh, and so this is, uh, we took action to correct that, but at the same time, we uh, took action in this year's budget uh, to do a complete revaluation of residential as well, which will again further balance things out, fairness to all. Uh, so just so that people understand, this was something that people have been aware of since we began talking about it in December of 2017. Uh, and we were very specific that uh, the commercial and industrial side was well below fair market value. So uh, it comes as no surprise to me or to other people observing this process that there were some significant increases. So the opportunity to prepare for it uh, has, uh, has been there. Anyone else wishing to make public comments uh, this evening on any other matter? And close the public comment uh, period. Uh, minutes of September 5, 2018, regular town council meeting. I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Any comments or corrections? See none. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Uh, we will, we have three 7 p.m. public hearings scheduled. Uh, that was really an oversight on my part to not move those all to six o'clock uh, when we started at six so that we could uh, conclude with an executive session. Uh, uh, and therefore, we're going to skip all three so as to be in compliance with the notice requirement and won't take them up until seven o'clock. Uh, we'll therefore uh, take uh, old business order number 1862 as the next matter on the agenda. Act on the request to approve the names posted to the various committees and boards as recommended by the Appointments and Negotiations Committee. And I'd ask for Councillor Babine to speak um, to this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to the right page in my book here. Um, so at the last meeting, we posted several names for several committees that are included in the agenda. Um, there is one adjustment, and I can't, uh, now my computer's freezing up. There was one adjustment uh, to that. Um, so those uh, names are um, uh, Ms. Torrens to the Board of Assessment Review, Mr. Gray to Coastal Water and Harbor Committee. We're actually withdrawing that one, correct? That's correct. Um, he is asked to be withdrawn. He's unable to serve um, on that. So um, 
um, we would ask that, um, I guess the best way to do that is through an amendment. Um, Ms. Grew to the Housing Alliance, Ms. Bailey to the Senior Advisory, Rudy Karen to ZBA, and Richard du Dupair to the Planning Board, as well as uh, Joel Simons. Um, Thank you. If there's no questions, I'd make a motion to approve as yeah. posted. Thank you. Uh, public comment on, on the oh, post yep. Seeing none, I'll accept a motion. Um, so moved. Second. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Discussion. If, I could, yeah, if I could move to amend and withdraw um, um, Howard Gray from the Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee as an amendment to remove him from the list. Okay. Uh, the uh, main motion has been amended. Uh, uh, may I have a second? Second. Uh, discussion on the amendment? Uh, voting on the amendment uh, to the main motion. All in favor? Motion as amended for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Councilor Rowan had some business that he had to attend to that uh, kept him uh, for a few minutes. Thank you for making the effort to uh, arrive as quickly as you could. Uh, new business, order 18-63. First reading and refer to the planning board, the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map. And I believe Dan Bacon is here to present. Uh, thank you. Yes. Mr. Bacon's here on behalf of the uh, uh, new owners of Scarborough Downs uh, to bring to our attention a zoning issue that they are proposing be corrected. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dan Bacon uh, of Coral Palmer here on behalf of, as introduced, uh, Crossroads Holdings LLC, who's the team is here in the audience uh, this evening. And this is a proposed zoning map amendment. Um, I think as the council likely recalls from the spring and, and past work on the Crossroads District, uh, the Crossroads Plan Development District is a zone specific to the Scarborough Downs property, uh, given the size of the property and its significance in town. And it was designed to follow the property boundaries of the Downs. And so, in fact, this past spring, uh, we went through a zoning map amendment process where when Crossroad Holdings acquired the Downs, they discovered uh, through uh, a survey and deed research that what the tax assessor thought was the Downs wasn't actually the Downs in terms of the land holdings. So we did an amendment process working with you as the council and the planning board on kind of reconciling the tax assessor's map and the zoning map so that the property boundaries matched the zoning district. Um, and so that was done. And um, since that time, we've been working on various phases of the project, as you well know, um, and have begun work on phase two, um, which is the area of the downs that's up towards Payne Road. And it's an area that is being designed for, and we're working with the planning board on uh, really an economic development area, a light industrial portion of the project and um, in that portion of the project, there's required buffers from the light industrial area to the adjacent zones. And as we've looked, worked, looked and worked on the master plan, which is down below, um, and, and laid that out, we've planned for buffers. And as part of that process, we've looked at an adjacent parcel that is actually a landlocked. So it doesn't have access other than through the downs or actually through Warren Woods, which is a land trust property that's the abutting property. And in looking at that property, it doesn't, so the, so the current property owner have really any use because they can't get to the property. Um, and, but we see it as having use for the Downs project in that it can provide more of a buffer to the land trust. Um, it also can uh, relieve and enable a bit more light industrial development on the edge of, of our property by acquiring it. So we're before you um, with a pending 
acquisition of the property to have a zoning map amendment so that this parcel can be included in the Crossroads District and um, have the same zoning designation. And actually, it's, it's kind of interesting where it actually can enable a larger buffer to the land trust property by acquiring this parcel and ensuring that it uh, is folded into our master plan and it would, we would otherwise um, provide. So that's my introduction um, to, to the zoning map change. It's about a 15-acre parcel. There isn't development planned for it. It's largely wetlands. Um, but we think it can be an asset to the project and to the district, um, including in the master plan, and be designed and planned in a kind of comprehensive way with our uh, phase two portion of the project. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, could you just help me understand, if, it, if it's just going to be a buffer, essentially, why do you need it to, uh, to be zoned? Um, I mean, why do you need the zone to change on it? Good question. <laughs> I'm going to use this map here, um, and, and this is something that's been submitted to the, to the planning board, and we're going to review that with the board in, the, in a few weeks. Um, currently, the zoning requires a 100-foot buffer between any development in this part of the project and an abutting residential district. So right now, this parcel is not zoned crossroads, it's, it's zoned rural and farm. So it's a residential district. So um, if this parcel wasn't part of the district, then there would be a, a 100 foot buffer required in this area, which would you know, reduce the light industrial area where we're actually planning for stormwater, um, stormwater ponds in this part of the property, maybe an additional lot. So by acquiring this, the buffer can be provided within this parcel, and that would be the intention. Thank you. Dan, can you identify on the map that you're just referring to uh, where the uh, new property is that is being proposed to be acquired? Uh, what sure. Where that is? It's, it's this, it's a 15 acre, more or less parcel in this location, outlined in red on this edge and on black on, on that edge. Um, the irony of it, too, is that this actually was in the Crossroads District originally, because the tax assessor thought this parcel went with the downs. So in a sense, it's going back, at least in this location, to the, if this is adopted, it would go back to the, the old designation. Other questions for Mr. Baker? Chris? So Dan, if you could tell me, how much of that 15 acres is actually developable, and how much is woodland? There's wetlands. Um, we have a wetland delineation on it. Uh, the exact acreage, I can't tell you at the podium right now, but I would say it's 80% wetlands. Um, and based on the wetland delineation, the uplands is actually the furthest from where development is proposed. So in other words, the uplands on this site are up here. And so this is all, most of this is wetland here. Um, another kind of key thing to understand is there's a pretty big grade change. So this is higher ground where you see development proposed than uh, the area down here. It's a, you know, it, it runs from say a 25 foot to 15 foot grade change. It's a pretty dom predominant bank here that, that drops down into the wetter area that's on the down site and also on Warren Woods. So it's not anticipated this would be included as for you know, significant development. It's more for enabling utilization of, of good uplands here and enabling this area to be a, a larger buffer to Warren Woods. Dan, is there, uh, is there uh, any uh, diminution or diminishment of the wetlands protection uh, as a consequence of this zone change proposal? At this point, we're not proposing to apply for a wetland impact, to apply for permitting for wetland impact. Um, so there's, you know, we don't anticipate at this point if, if, if 
impacting the wetlands. Um, you know, we'd be going through the planning board process to talk about those matters in the DEP process, but the intention is more to utilize uplands with this zone change than to, to significantly encroach into to the wetlands that exist. Um, and with, so, that answers your question. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Dan? Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Quick question. I think when you were back here in the spring, you kind of said you came for another contract zone exception that we talked about. You said, yeah, are there any other things you think you're going to need? And I thought the response at that point in time is no, you thought you were all set, and now we're back having the conversation. Are there other things that you're, you're going to think you're going to need in there? You mean zoning amendment? The zoning amendment, yeah. Not contract zone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms so of. I'd, I'd rather have them all at once. Right. Kind of piecemeal so we see the complete picture. Yeah, I think the, our intention when we were answering those questions in the spring was around uses. Um, and also as part of that conversation, um, our recollection was that we thought there is some, there had been some uncertainty around ownership of abutting parcels and um, the, the perimeter boundary of, of the zone and the property. So we did anticipate coming back to the council when um, smaller parcels would be acquired to be incorporated into the downs. There's a parcel actually closer to Haggis Parkway that there's been some question around the ownership of it, um, whether it's owned by the downs or owned by an abutter. So we, we did anticipate zoning map amendments based on kind of reconciling ownership. Um, we didn't anticipate coming back for like use changes because that, that the significant discussion this spring was should light industrial be allowed in the zone um, and we made those amendments working with you and, and felt that that's that was what we needed at that time um, so you're saying there may be some more I think in terms of zoning map amendments there, there could be in the future based on land that could be acquired that enables the, the site to be master planned uh, further in the future. Can't anticipate all of those things moving forward. Chris. So, so just so I'm clear, this is a parcel that has not been acquired yet. It's in the process of being acquired or it has been acquired? It's under contract and it's planned to be closed in the next few weeks. So, right. so this, this was not part of the original discussion that we had this this fall about the so this will be an additional piece to the crossroads district correct okay yeah the last the other question is what does it abut on the other side so specifically to the north of that i can't really see the two abutter well there's only one abutter it's warren woods okay. owned by the land trust so it's currently the downs is the abutter to the south and warren woods is to the i'll call it the east and the north and all setbacks for conservation requ requirements would be in place correct so the crossroads zone requires a 100-foot setback. Um, and it's actually more than a setback. It's no disturbed buffer. Mm -hmm. We anticipate that this would provide a 450 to 600-foot buffer in that development is not planned on the parcel. What it enables is full use of the good land, the upland that is currently on the downs parcel for light industrial use. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Councilor Gatorino. Um, yeah, I don't have a problem with this going forward because at this point all we're voting on is for it to go to the planning board for their sure. review and I, I trust them to come back to us with some clear idea as to what their thoughts are on, on this. So I would just remind councilors of that. Other comments, questions for Councilor Booth? So the I forgot what I was gonna say. Now you can go. Council Roma, why don't you take <laughs> your turn and we'll perfectly go back to Council. Uh, <laughs> could you could you speak at all to the current ownership or intent or, or use of the lot of, under the, the current owner, which I assume is not Warren Woods. You're not you're not purchasing it from the land trust. This is purchased from Private, would they be able to access that? I mean, it, it's just kind of a parcel in the middle of the. Um, I think they're, I don't know what their, their current intention is to sell it to the Downs. Um, there is not significant development potential, and the development potential is actually towards Warren Woods, which stands in the way of, 
of much development. Um, so, I mean, Rocky may have a better sense of their intentions, well, but no, I mean, <laughs> this is a parcel that has been kind of floating around because it was thought to have been actually part of the downs, um, but it turns out not to be. And now we think it can be an asset from a natural resource standpoint to be more of a buffer. And, and we've been in conversations with the land trust in general as our neighbor about interconnecting trails and having open space connectivity. So I think there's a great opportunity where this can ultimately maybe be um, of shared use, you know, by both users of the downs, but also the land trust. So uh, that's the intention. The intention is not for maximizing development or creating much impact there. It's more about buffer to the Warren Woods. I, I remember. <laughs> so, um, you know, you always try to make things a win-win. It seems to me that obviously that parcel would not be developable by the current owner. You're creating a situation and an opportunity for that person to, I'm sure they're thrilled to be able to uh, sell that piece of property. I, I would just encourage the planning board that when they do take a look at that, the interconnectivity of trails, um, you know, I would I'd want to make sure that that's included. That would be important. But I also totally see the advantage of you being able to maximize the good pieces of what you do have by adding that in. So I have no concerns about this going forward. Thank you. Other questions for Dan? Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, any member of the public uh, wishing to speak to this issue, please approach the podium. Close public comment on uh, this order, and I would accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Pretty simple. Yeah, I think it's pretty simple. We're, uh, the, the order and the motion is... Uh, uh, requiring the matter to be sent to the planning board for evaluation. And then it will be coming back to the town council for a final deliberation. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Order 18-64. Act on the request to authorize the sale of tax-acquired properties as recommended by the assistant town manager and to authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents necessary. And I'd ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, some members of council may remember this. I, I wish I could recall the exact date, but it's been several years since uh, I did approach the council uh, and provided an update on a number, frankly, a couple of dozen tax acquired properties, some of which dated back into the mid-50s, frankly. Uh, at that time, I came forward with a recommendation on what to do with them, and um, part of that disposition was to sell certain of them and received authorization at the time. And frankly, I've been remiss in not uh, advancing that public sale process. Uh, my assistant has helped uh, jumpstart that process, and so uh, we come before you this evening proposing the sale of five different properties. And I'll just list them uh, very quickly. 127 Holmes Road, 27 Holmes Road, 14 Hearn Road, 9 Bridges Drive, and 6 Ward Street. Uh, as I said, we did go through, as our policy requires, a, uh, a sealed bid uh, sale process. And actually had to go through it a second time on a couple properties uh, uh, due to lack of bids. But ultimately, we, we do, did receive bids on all five properties. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's present here, but one of the properties, there were multiple bids, and we recommended the high bid before you. Uh, the other bidder did submit a letter, uh, was in your packet. Uh, it does appear as though that property, uh, not just appear, we read the deed. It has some very unique and specific deed restrictions. They were there when we uh, acquired ownership through tax and foreclosure. <coughs> Uh, speaking to the specific type of structure, size of structure, so on and so forth. Uh, and um, apparently this uh, other gentleman is in the butter and, and wants to make certain that those uh, restrictions are enforced. Frankly, it's a civil matter between mm -hmm. property owners. Uh, I, I hope we're not setting up a, a problem in that regard, but I don't really see that at this juncture we have any, um, any dog in that fight, frankly. So... Uh, we're recommending uh, award to the highest bidder, and I can go through those uh, all five if you like. 
Uh, is there anything in terms of impact on uh, residents that should be reported out? I'm not sure if I understand your question, sir. Is there, uh, are any of these properties presently occupied by owners? No. Or, or are there all properties that have been acquired uh, by the town and are now in order to be sold? And they're, the all, they're all vacant land at this point. There's no structure that exists uh, on them. And frankly, with the exception of one, I don't think any of the other ones could support a structure given their size and limitations. Any, uh, any requests, Council Davis? So um, to go back to the manager's um, question about whether or not to read those bids into the record, um, I would take the manager's recommend personally to the chair. Um, whatever legally is required, I, you know, some reason since the bids sure. are a public document I don't see any harm in reading those bids out loud so that the public knows that we're doing our due diligence certainly not pleased to do that so with respect to 127 Holmes Road uh, we propose to award to Kerry Norton for the bid price of $58,200 27 Holmes Road we propose to award the bid to Daniel Horahan for $1,000 14 Hearn Road we propose to award the bid to Richard and Nancy Horton for $1. <clears throat> for 19 Bridges Drive, we propose to award to James Dwyer for $2,223. And for 6 Ward Street, we propose to award to Michael D'Souza for the total sum of $1,675 for a grand total of $63,099 for all five properties. Other questions of the top manager? Councilor Rowe. The, the, um, you mentioned that you thought only one could actually support a structure. Was that the 127? Correct. Okay, thank you. Correct. Other questions for the town manager? <coughs> Bill. Council Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, a couple, and I wasn't sure whether to wait until there is a motion, but I'll definitely ask questions now. So um, I don't remember the name of the LD, but I think it's 1269. That was just recently passed by the legislature regarding tax foreclosed properties. I just want to make sure that um, We've taken into consideration whatever that new legal requirement is regarding foreclosed tax foreclosed properties that were in compliance. It was just passed by a special session of legislature, yes. so it's not yet effective. It okay. was not passed as emergency legislation, so I don't feel we're bound by that. Um, I don't believe it applies in any event. Uh, that really pertains to owner-occupied uh, property. I just want to make sure. Yeah. And so I think uh, I think. We're, we're okay and within the spirit and not violating the spirit of that legislation, even if we yep. had to comply. So the second tier to that question is, um, in the spirit of that legislation, um, how are we, I mean, uh, when you hear a $1 bid that we're accepting, how does that compare to the fair market value or even the assessed value of that property um, that we're accepting, as well as in comparison to the amount of the tax lien? I can't speak to the tax lien, but I can tell you that property is, uh, it, it, it abuts the, the Horton property. Uh, it's entirely wet and totally unbuildable. So uh, I guess our philosophy is uh, it's doing no, serving no public purpose, uh, present or future, from our estimation. Uh, and it's better to get it on the tax rolls and have it used as productive sure. as it possibly could. So how about the $58,000 piece of property? Obviously, there's greater value in that one in comparison to our fair market value. Perhaps there is. Uh, you know, the, the competitive open process we went through yielded uh, this amount. Uh, we could potentially yield a higher amount through, uh, you know, listing it with a broker through more conventional means. means. I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, but uh, uh, we followed the policy process, which is okay. a uh, competitive sealed bid process. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, just curious, how, how long were the bids uh, open? What, what time frame was given? <clears throat> I beg your pardon, I don't know exactly. I'm sure it's in the order of a month at least. Uh, we did notice all the butters as well as a way to uh, drum up business. And I think actually Larissa reached out to a number of brokers uh, in town and made them just generally aware. So we, in our best interest, we tried to get the word out. We certainly didn't want this to be quiet. And is, is there a way to, I mean, is there a, a standard through which we publicize it in terms of like, I don't know, newspaper? Like we didn't think of a special or? legal ad, no. Okay. Um, no. Great, thank you. Other questions, of the town manager? Uh, anyone in the public wishing to speak to this matter, please approach the podium. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Any further discussion uh, on this matter? Thank you. Thank you. All in favor.
Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Order 18-65, act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the municipal elections for Tuesday, November 6, 2018 at the Scarborough High School Alumni Gym. Appoint the warden and deputy warden, set the hours for voter registration, and act on appointments of election ballot clerks pursuant to Chapter 200, Article Roman Numeral 8, uh, nomination election, and authorize the town clerk to make any additional appointments as necessary. And I'd ask the town clerk to introduce this matter. We've supplied you with a list of names. Our warden would recommend uh, Bill Penley and Alan, uh, Alan Paul. Uh, Deputy warden would be Janice Al uh, Joyce Alden. And um, we start absentee voting October 9th here at Town Hall. Que questions of the town clerk? Uh, anyone uh, in the public wishing to make a comment on this matter, please approach the podium. I'll accept the motion. So Move. <laughs> Go ahead. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Councilor Katarina. Uh, I want to thank all of these citizens who are willing to work on election day. I was an election worker for a number of years and it's, I mean, it's fun, it's rewarding and um, it's hard, it's hard, it is hard work and you don't get paid very well, but that's okay. Um, so I appreciate um, these folks stepping forward. Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank you. Just, just a reminder with absentee balloting starting uh, right up here, uh, we'll be constrained uh, to Chambers A going forward. Uh, in rare occasions, we may be able to grab some space in B, but we'll try to stay confined to A, so we'll have to break that all down. Thank you. Uh, item eight on the agenda, non-action items. There are none. Uh, item nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, Councilor Kazo, let's start down at your end. Uh, long range planning continues to meet for comprehensive planning review and uh, with reports coming through is uh, available but certainly that information and feedback is still available to the public I would encourage you to go online and give your comments uh, or participate in in any of the uh, public sessions we have scheduled thank you Councilor Hayes yeah coastal harbor map there's they put the finishing touching on the mooring ordinance that will be coming forward um, shellfish met and the Conversation continues around survey and measuring the camp flats. It's a continuing conversation, so I'll have more on it next time. Um, Finance Committee did meet this week. We had some scheduling conflicts, but the next scheduled meeting is October 16th at 6 p.m. And, and the, agenda, the agenda for the public, do you recall the items on the agenda that are going to be discussed? Um, it will be the review of the financial statements. We are going to discuss you know, we've been talking for a couple of years now about forecasting and modeling. That's going to be on the agenda. Um, and we also talked about the equipment reserve fund. We actually have something saying, <clears throat> you know, do we want to start reserving some for some of our larger pieces of equipment, things like, you know, a million dollar fire engine. It's in, in what our conversation is. It's in the policy, and we just wanted to kind of touch on it and say, do we want to do something with that? Is that a good policy for us to pursue going forward? So the important issues, uh, uh, they are esoteric and uh, uh, remain within the Finance Committee, uh, but uh, they are important issues. Councilor Gatorino. Um We did not have a communications meeting. Again, um, we had a couple of people who weren't able to make it. So that the next scheduled meeting for that is not until December 13th. Um, Ordinance Committee is tomorrow night at 4.30. Uh, we will be looking at resident survey on marijuana, um, which doesn't have to do with your thoughts on marijuana, but basically on, um, you know, retail sales and, th and, and whatever, how the town should be working with it in ordinances. So stay tuned for that or come to the meeting. Temporary signs in the right of way, which is very timely, considering that election signs can go out next week. And then moorings uh, has come back to us from you guys. <laughs> so we'll be talking about those uh, tomorrow, and that's at 4.30 in Council Chamber A. And that's it for me. Thank you. The, the sign issue is always controversial. We're really talking about signs in the right of way. 
not signs on private property, which are much less restricted. But the state has adopted uh, some new rules. Uh, the town is permitted to have more stringent rules. Uh, and compliance is always an issue. And what we're trying to do is balance uh, uh, appropriate use of First Amendment rights uh, versus uh, actually controlling the, informa the, uh, uh, the use of the right of way uh, for uh, advertising messages. So it is, uh, it's an issue uh, that uh, I think the, it's important for the Ordinance Committee to take a look at. Uh, Councilor Foley. Um, the Eastern Trail Alliance had their largest fundraiser of the year, which was the main lighthouse ride, and a huge success. It was a beautiful day. Uh, I think they, I don't have, remember the exact numbers, but it was somewhere between 12 and 1,300 riders this year. Um, and those riders, some of them, you know, 25 miles, many of them 40 or 50. And often at the end of the day, we had riders coming in who'd read, ridden over 100 miles and hit all the lighthouses up and down the coast. So, um, Great event for them, and uh, I'll get a total of how much money they raised uh, at our next meeting. Conservation Commission also met uh, last week, mostly reviewing uh, language um, that is in the comp plan to move that forward as well. And um, they are reaching out, and, and I spoke with um, Councillor Chiazzo a, a little bit looking for ways to perhaps increase their involvement or connection to the planning board, particularly as it pertains to any developments that may have some conservation implications. Um, so we're gonna just kind of talk through how that we might keep them better connected uh, moving forward. And that's it. Thank you. How's the road? Yeah, thank you. I had no committees meet uh, since our last meeting. However, I just wanted to put out a reminder that the Honeywell House will be open this Saturday from 11 to 3 and manned by several members of the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee. So once again, this Saturday, uh, 11 to 3. Um, and the um, um, project by Avesta at South Bridge, is it? Southgate. Uh, Southgate. Uh, that's moving along. And I've heard remarks that people are very pleased that we're combining both affordable housing and the restoration of uh, a home that has been here for a long, long time. That's it's exciting. Place to see it move forward. Been well received. Yeah. Council Bay by. I have no reports. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, town manager's report. Yes, a couple items of uh, note. Um, we have set the tax rate, as was mentioned. Um, despite what was said at the podium, the tax rate has not changed. It stayed constant at 1649. Uh, a number of the choices that uh, the council made through its budget process. Uh, uh, otherwise would have perhaps certainly would have lowered that um, that total tax rate but um, I think I would say you made some wise choices in terms of funding uh, the residential reveal out of appropriation which is kind of a unique um, occurrence for us beyond that uh, the council is preparing for future uh, liabilities uh, with respect to some tax appeals that continue to linger uh, in the court system and we've got some other potential exposure um, through the abatement process with an exemption request that I think um, we need to be properly um, prepared for. And so our overlay is much, much larger this year than it is normally. Um, so without those items, uh, I think there would have been a, uh, a noticeable decrease in the tax rate, but I do applaud your uh, fiscal prudence, I think, in making these decisions of preparing uh, for the future. Um, the bills are sent to the tax, to, to the, uh, printer for uh, printing and they should be mailed out by the end of the week. It is a quick turnaround this year with first half payment due October 15th. Uh, for folks that want to know um, on the assessing website, you can see the tax amount um, and the new values uh, if that's of interest uh, to folks before they actually receive the bill. Uh, we've been approached by a local production company, uh, New England Productions is the name, and they're interested in doing something that I'll they're calling Scarborough Law. Some might have seen um, some uh, kind of reality series that uh, involved the main warden service. It's probably fairly close to that by way of concept. Um, we're a bit apprehensive, but anxious and interested at the same time. Um, we're interested in showing kind of all the all the different angles of law enforcement um, and kind of the human side, much of what we're doing and the success we're having on the opioid issue we hope uh, will be kind of a, a theme that emerges. 
Uh, at this point, we do maintain complete editorial control, and we're interested in at least going through and getting a pilot shot to see what that might look like. So um, the police department will be doing a lot more publicity about that, but I wanted to kind of get that word out there. Uh, and uh, the other thing that we're thinking about is possibly a recruiting tool. We continue to be challenged to find uh, good candidates, and uh, perhaps this will help. With respect to the public safety building, uh, we continue to work on the budget. Um, I'm more confident now than I was two weeks ago that we will be within budget. We certainly will be, but I think we'll do it in such a way that it's not going to be very painful. Um, I applaud the design team working very, very uh, hard to come up with different uh, value engineering and alternative designs that won't compromise performance, uh, but uh, get us to within budget. Uh, we continue to wait for the DEP permit. It's a bit of a sore point for us uh, at this point. Uh, it simply needs to be written, and uh, that seems easy enough, but that's been weeks uh, in that status and continues. So uh, we'll continue to be vigilant in that regard. And lastly, um, as was mentioned, uh, we did have our kickoff meeting with our staff and consultant for the residential revaluation. This is going to be a massive undertaking. The, in the endeavor is. Uh, intends to visit all 9,000 residential properties in town and do a full measure and list, as they call it. Um, so that work will, will uh, start as soon as uh, mid-October. And between now and then, we need to do a lot of public notice and outreach. Our intent is to start at the beach communities, uh, thought being uh, many of those are seasonal and we'd like to uh, uh, contact them while they're still here, hopefully. So we'll, we'll make that effort first. And I think we'll try to use technology to our and social media to our benefit. Uh, the next door application uh, is particularly good at localizing a message out to certain neighborhoods. So we'll try to stay in advance of that and tell people when we're going next. So stay tuned. We'll have uh, uh, an informational meeting coming up uh, in the, probably by mid October just to talk about the overall project. Thank you. Thank you. Picking up on uh, the town manager's report on the tax, uh, the tax issues, uh, if you're, we have now set uh, the uh, tax rate, and if you did not have a change in assessed value on your property, uh, which is the case for 99.9% .9 of all residential property owners, then that means that your tax bill this year will look identical to the tax bill you got last year. There'll be no raise. Uh, Councilor comments. Councilor Bayman, let's start at your end. Thank you. Um, I, I really want to give kudos to uh, the Council's Finance Committee, um, but as well as to the Council as a whole. I know a little self-gratification there. Um, because to, to come in at where we are does take a lot of work and a lot of effort that we all contribute to. And I think to have a 0% tax increase, uh, while it would have been nice to have been a little bit lower, um, but I think we were fiscally prudent in some of our decisions, including increasing the overlay um, to cover um, possible settlements regarding the tax appeal litigation. Um, that is absolutely ridiculous, but it's fiscally responsible for us to do that. So, because uh, otherwise it would have been at least something coming back to the people. Um, so I, I want to say thank you to everybody um, and to staff in particular and to the school department because they were a big part of that. School board, um, the superintendent was a very, very big part of that. So I want to say thank you. The only other item I want to bring up tonight, because I do, I want to ask this to be in the record and in the minutes, if you don't mind. Um, tonight at 7 o'clock, we have a public hearing. And the very first public hearing, which is 18061, is on um, this, with this planning board um, for a preliminary review of a contract zone application submitted by Clearview Condominium Association with action by the council. Um, and I want to ask, um, so I live, literally, I want to say, 50 yards from the intersection in which this parcel is located. And so um, how people sometimes perceive conflicts versus actual conflicts can be a challenge to address is that I would like to bring up and ask the council to provide an opinion about whether or not um, I can continue. There is no actual conflict. Um, I'm three houses from the intersection, but um, some people might get sensitive and say that there is. So I'd like you to uh, take that up so that it's officially in the minutes if you don't mind. Thank you for uh, raising the matter. Uh, as I think all the counselors are aware, uh, uh, when you have a conflict of interest, it generally mm -hmm. relates to a pecuniary interest, that you stand to make money 
uh, off a decision that you might make. Uh, otherwise, it gets into grayer areas and involves whether or not you are unduly influenced uh, by the condition that's before the, uh, before the town council. Uh, in this case, Councilor Baybine has brought to our attention that he lives in that neighborhood uh, and uh, wants that to be part of the public record. And I applaud you for doing that. That's very quite appropriate. Uh, and if anyone uh, uh, wishes to make a motion uh, uh, to recuse, uh, I would accept such a motion. Uh, if you wish to comment on whether you think there is any reason uh, to take no action, I'd also accept comments in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that's, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Councillor Rowan, public uh, uh, council comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I took a, I had a lengthy phone conversation today with a, um, uh, uh, an owner of several commercial properties here in town, um, and he had some concerns that he just wanted me to relay. Um, the, the first being um, really just about the timing. Um, it was really unfortunate the way that the, the timing worked out and that they got the letter right before uh, Labor Day weekend and then only had the week of Labor Day to, to schedule appointments. Um, but he was also um, uh, a little bit confused about the way that the process works from, from the budget, and I just wanted to um, explore, uh, offer a little bit of an explanation in case anyone else was also confused. He, his thinking was that we had set a mill rate and then uh, the valuation came in, and therefore there was a windfall to the town. Um, but it works, it works the other way. We, we set the budget in June. Um, the assessor and the contractor did their work in, um, you know, over the finished up over the course of the summer, right up until September, where they were figuring out the valuation. And then the mill rate didn't get set until they finished their work, because the mill rate is the budget divided by the total valuation, and then you set the mill rate. So it was really just <coughs> happenstance, and because of the you know the increased um, amount put into the overlay by the assessor, that that it worked out to be the same. Is my understanding? Yes. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and then uh, my only other comment was I think that um, Scarborough Law sounds incredibly exciting, and uh, <laughs> I hope the folks on the force are really excited about it as well, because I think that that would be really fun. Yeah, um, and I know that uh, Councilor Hayes had taken a ride. Uh, and found it to be a very enlightening, interesting, and a, a reflection of the professionalism of the Scarborough Police Department. So that, uh, that's Just right. to clarify, that was in the front seat, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I should clarify that. Uh, when it comes out, I'm going to have to get people. And uh, just to follow up on your comment about the, um, the hearings that were held for the uh, reval for commercial industrial properties. That does not, those were held so as to allow people the opportunity, if they thought, gee, you've really made a serious mistake here, uh, let's go in and have an informal discussion with the people who did the analysis, which was KRT was the name of the company. That does not preclude any commercial or industrial property owner who receives a tax bill with this increased assessment from filing a normal tax abatement uh, application and uh, allows you the opportunity to follow whether you want to go to the Board of Assessment Review and make your case there or go directly to Superior Court. Uh, you have that option. Uh, and so those, those rights are not extinguished or impaired in any way. So I, I want to make sure commercial industrial property owners are aware uh, that there's no adverse impact by, by this first round of preliminary hearings. Uh, Councilor Foley. Yep. Um, so I wanted to commend town staff and the, uh, the Downs development team because I think one of the things that we hear a lot of uh, from folks is that we don't listen and that not only do we not listen, we don't care or we don't respond. And, um, you know, whether I agree or disagree with my fellow counselors on any given issue, the one thing I, I do know for certain is that everyone behind this table does care uh, and a great deal. And we may just have different ways about in which we believe we should move things forward. So, um, I, you know, I think having those information sessions that were pulled together rather quickly, while some might, 
you know, go out there and criticize the fact that, well, it wasn't done this way. Well, at least it was done, and we're making mm -hmm. some strides and making some efforts to respond. And for me, that's what's truly important. I go back to one of the things that, you know, I, I put in my campaign uh, literature was basically, you know, if you tell me something, I'm going to forget about it. If you teach me something, I might remember it. But if you involve me, I'm going to learn and I'm going to grow. And I think for me, you know, this is a huge project. And I like the direction that I see us moving in terms of trying to get people more involved. Um, and I, I think when people are more involved and more educated, they feel more comfortable. And it's not this big, scary uh, uh, conspiracy. So. There's obviously a lot of details we still aren't sharing and we can't share yet because we don't really have them all either, but we're working through it and as a community, if we can learn to work through these kinds of things together, I think the town will be better off all around. So wanted to say thank you to, uh, you know, again, town staff and Downs Development Team for doing that. And I would add my appreciation to the assistant town manager who ran two uh, public sessions uh, 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 recently, uh, and pretty well received in terms of uh, the people who uh, attended, and there was also two public sessions held by the Scarborough Downs team yesterday at Scarborough Downs, and we happened to be going, uh, Tom Andrew and I going out as they were coming in, and they went on for an hour and a half or more uh, in each of those two sessions, and about, I think about 70 people showed up for them, so uh, uh, it, it, again, it was their own initiative to uh, allow people to better understand what is it that we're talking about here. Uh, Mr. Council Chair, Mr. Chair yes. just a correction. I, I just want to make sure that, that uh, it's publicly stated that there's another one of La I'm Larissa's. Sure oh, okay. Don't I, I defer. Good. <laughs> Mr. Gatorino, okay. strike the remarks of Thank Council Thank no, you. No, no. That's okay. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to again thank the Finance Committee for all the hard work that you guys did uh, to get us to a zero increase uh, tax. I know there were a lot of um, pushing, pulling, adding, subtracting, uh, making decisions, and I think uh, I agree that there was a lot of responsible work done, particularly with uh, this concept of overlay, which is putting money aside in case you need to pay it because of um, things that may come up on. Uh, Tax abatements um, are, are, are basically what, what we look at with that. Um, and the TIF, oh, geez. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, TIF um, workshop will be next Monday, another one at 6 o'clock at the Scarborough Public Library. I've received a lot of, of quite a few emails, talked to a number of people, and uh, Councillor Foley said it very well. Um, there's a lot we can't say. We're in negotiations. It's like anything. You know, I can't let you know exactly what's going on as much as I'd like to. We can't. Um, but I do find there's a lot of mm, misinterpretation, misinformation, misunderstanding about TIF, and credit enhancement, and differences, and what they are and aren't. So I encourage anyone to come uh, to the library for question and answer uh, next Monday at 6 o'clock. And this, um, through the chair to the to the manager, um, are these being videoed? Are they going to go up on? They're not, and, and really purposely, we we, okay. um, we had some experiences through the budget process uh, before the budget and after it was presented, and frankly, we found that folks are more uh, interested and, and willing to be part of the conversation. Okay. Um, I, I think we could probably work that in to more formal settings, but we find the conversation is far more productive. Because that was asked. Yeah. Right. That's all I have. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Yeah, just pivoting to a little bit different topic and sort of building on some of the things already said, but we are entering the political season. We've heard about signs already. <laughs> um, but I do want to say I think we have a record number of candidates running this year for mm -hmm. local offices, and there's some great people. And as you can tell, being up here is not the easiest thing, so I really applaud all those stepping forward. And just urge everybody out there, there's, there are some great people that are out there to get a chance to get to know them. There is going to be a candidate night where you can get to some of them. So now's the time to kind of spend some time to figure out who you want to be sitting behind the table here. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gaiazzo. 
So I'll take a little bit of a different tact. Um, I won't thank the Finance Committee because uh, I, I know I was on it. So. <laughs> um, I will thank the voters, though. Um, in, in the last three years, we've passed two budgets the first time through. And that's really, to me, where the rubber meets the road, is, is when, when the community supports the process and supports the efforts and supports a budget, it, it definitely makes our job a lot easier in terms of making those tough decisions because we know we have the backings of, of, of the community. So um, I want to just thank everybody that supported the budget. That continues to, um, to, to sometimes be a challenge, and that, and that challenges us as a finance committee in a very positive way because uh, all the budget is is a reflection of a community's needs and desires. So it's important for us to hear that. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to say thanks for, for passing that budget the first time around. And, and I'm confident, um, it's, it, even though I won't be participating in next year's cycle, it will be uh, just as engaging and just as meaningful. And uh, I, I, I applaud whoever's going to be taking up the mantle from this <laughs> point forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, last week, uh, uh, Scarborough, uh, through the sponsorship of uh, SEDCO, our uh, economic development arm, uh, held its annual all-committee meeting. And this is all of the committees uh, uh, where uh, public contributions are made by citizens. Uh, uh, at the meeting, uh, we have now really established an award for the Outstanding Volunteer of the Year. Uh, and that award was given to uh, a very, very deserving uh, woman, Judy Roy, yeah. who has uh, spent many decades of public service uh, to this community. So that was, uh, that was applauded by all. So I want to uh, uh, recognize Judy for her decades of contribution. Um, we are uh, going to meet in executive session after uh, this meeting concludes. Uh, the town manager, the SEDCO director, uh, Karen Martin, and I have spent uh, a large part of the last two weeks in negotiating with the Scarborough Downs people. Uh, we are presenting the results of those efforts to the town council after uh, this uh, public meeting tonight, and we hope to have more to report to everyone, hopefully tomorrow, uh, but soon. I think we are now past 7 o'clock so that we are able to conduct uh, the public hearings that uh, were scheduled for the beginning of the evening. And I'm going to start with order number 18-61, 7 p.m. public hearing of the Scarborough Town Council and Planning Board for a preliminary review of a contract zone application submitted by Clearwater Condominium Association with action by the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, and I would ask the applicant to uh, undertake the uh, introduction. Mr. Chairman, um, I think planning board is an active participant in this. Yes. Um, and so we thought it'd be best if we convene around the table here with your uh, the, uh, folks from the planning board. Uh, so just a, a couple minute recess. Okay, we'll take to get organized. a two minute recess to organize ourselves around the table with the planning board. Thank you.
Um, I'm Alyssa Tibbetts. I'm an attorney with Jensen Baird, uh, and I represent uh, what is officially known as the Rosero Clearview Condominium Association, but I just want to clear up some of the title here. There are, in fact, two condo associations on the property that we're discussing here. They are, in fact, two separate lots. One is the Clearview Condominium Association. The other is the Rosero Clearview Condominium, Condominium Association, which, in fact, has nothing to do with the Rosero family or the Rosero brothers at this time. Um, it's been re referenced as Clearview Condominium Association on your agenda. It's in fact not, but you know it's, it's a little confusing, and I just want to sort of set the stage for you what we're talking about in terms of, of lots here. So if you can see, um, you see the yellow outline that's on this aerial photo. The property that we are discussing is along Eastern Road. Um, there are, as I said, two lots. The first lot is what's outlined in white, if you, can, if you can tell on the colors here, is the Clearview Condominium Association that I just referenced. Um, that was known as phase one in the original approval of, these, of this development. What's outlined in yellow is the Rosvera Clearview Condominium Association. And associated with that or attached to that lot is what we've also outlined in yellow and labeled as a vacant lot. Um, that lot, the vacant lot, is really what we're discussing tonight and the subject of our proposal. But it is part of the Rosvera Clearview Condo Association lot. And the purpose that it served when it was um, originally approved was for acreage and density of the original development. So the lot's vacant now. There is nothing on it. There never has been anything on it. It's always been separated by Portland Farms Road, which is, which is the road that bisects these two properties. Um, but, in fact, it has been calculated or used towards the calculations of the Rosvera Clearview Condominium Association development for purposes of density. Um, and so I'm going to... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you get caught up over there. Um, so just, that's, that's just sort of orient you, and you'll see throughout your packet of materials and the application that we provided um, a little bit more detail about the history of the properties in terms of the phasing of the condominium plans, um, as well as uh, a reference to an inclusion of the property tax map that actually shows this as one lot, um, even though it's in fact two lots. But, oh, okay, I can see that. Uh, and all of the supporting documents, and I won't go through those in, in great detail, but that kind of gives you some, provides you some context of the properties that we're talking about. It's, a little bit complicated um, in terms of when we get to the contract zoning agreement proposal, uh, what we're asking for. Um, we've provided for you the supporting documentation with respect to the condominium association's authorization to move forward with this application. Um, the, not only the board, but all of the unit owners have voted. All copies of those are provided for you uh, that all voted in support of moving forward with the application and authorizing the president of the board, who's with us here tonight, Matt Garrett to move forward with the application. Matt's also happy to discuss any, you know, any questions they might have about that specifically or, or the condo association itself. So those materials have been provided to you um, for, for general reference, as well as all of the supporting documents related to the condo association itself, uh, which includes some of the history with respect to the original ownership, uh, the division of the two associations, and some history that we'll get into in more detail with respect to uh, changes in ownership and development phases and, and subdivision approvals uh, over the course of ownership of this property. Um, so I want to talk about those in the context of uh, those issues in the context of the contract zoning agreement proposal specifically, but I'd like to have Nancy St. Clair, the site, the engineer for the project, talk more specifically about the site analysis, the property itself, um, and, and somewhat of the proposal before we discuss the sort of legal considerations related to the agreement and what we provide as a draft. As Alyssa mentioned, my name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm a civil engineer. We are the project engineers on the project. My husband David uh, is a land surveyor and he is a surveyor of the project. So as Alyssa pointed out, as you can see on the aerial photo, uh, we're primarily discussing the vacant lot that is on what would be the easterly side of Portland Farms Road. As you can see in the aerial, you can orient yourself with Route 1. Uh, kind of goes on a diagonal in the upper left corner. Portland Farms Road provides a divider between the developed portion of the Rosvera Clearview Condominium Association property and this vacant piece of land. 
The vacant piece of land uh, is about 1.6 acres in size, and I'm going to show you a few photos uh, of the site itself in just a moment. So the site, as I mentioned, is severed from the remainder of the property by Portland Farms Road. There is a mature buffer uh, of trees along uh, the developed portion of the condominium project such that there were actually a few condominium owners who weren't even aware that that was part of their land. Uh, so with this piece of property not being used, uh, with it being something that would be more fitting in a single family type residential setting, uh, we are proposing to look at a contract zone uh, for the area. As I mentioned, the site is 1.6 acres in size. It's located on the corner of Portland Farms Road and Eastern Road. And you can see Eastern Road, uh, everybody knows where Eastern Road is, but it runs generally parallel to Route 1. <coughs> so the next page that I wanted to show you are just some photos that were actually taken of the site uh, today. Uh, and these are actually both views are uh, the photographer standing on Portland Farms Road looking toward the site. The lines that you see uh, in the front of each photo are actually the sidewalk along Portland Farms Road. And as you can see, the site is quite overgrown. Uh, it's generally flat. It is uh, slightly above Portland Farms Road. It does generally slope toward the eastern road. Uh, the light pole you can see is right in the middle there. The next two photos show uh, generally the view from Portland Farms Road as well. However, this one, uh, the one on the left, is actually taken more looking in a general uh, southeasterly direction. So uh, you can see the lawn of the abutting property, and you can see where the property begins uh, where the tall grasses are. As you move further down the site frontage, the one on the left is actually closer to the intersection uh, with the Eastern Road. Eastern Road is, is on the right side uh, of that photo. And you can see the sidewalk along Portland Farms Road there. So it's a generally flat, as I mentioned, generally drains down toward the Eastern Road. The database information uh, in the, the town's GIS database shows that the soils on the site are quite good soils. Uh, they're primarily an A soil, which is a free draining soil. They were mapped um, as part of the soil as a gravel pit and as a uh, loamy sand, which are both uh, very good soils conducive to development. There is a very small area adjacent to uh, Eastern Road, which is mapped as a scantic silt loam. However, based on the vegetation, uh, it does not appear that there's any concerns uh, about that. It's just simply a, a portion of the property itself. So as we move down further, <coughs> these images were taken from the back corner of the property, the northerly corner of the property. So they're on sort of the wood line at the back of the lot, and they're actually taken looking towards the Portland Farms Road. So they would be uh, the one on the right-hand side. You can see the mowed lawn of the abutting property, and you can see the tall grasses uh, on the site. On the one on the left, it's looking more in a direction toward the intersection with Portland Farms Road and the Eastern Road. In both of the photos, you can see that that mature tree line we talked about uh, earlier is sort of that visual divider uh, that is in addition to the Portland Farms Road itself that divides the condominiums from this piece of property. <coughs> The last two photos that I have are shown. Uh, the one on the left is actually standing at the intersection of Portland Farms Road and the Eastern Road. And it gives a pretty good panoramic view of the lot area in question. The house that you see in the left photo, in the left of the photo, uh, is the house on the neighboring subdivision. And then on that same photo on the right hand side is the first house on the Eastern Road. Uh, so you see that we're located on the corner. One of the things I wanted to point out is the ability 
of all of the utilities uh, are right in that area, and that photo shows it. And we do have overhead power right along the site frontage. We do have a sidewalk along the site frontage. There's a closed drainage system on Portland Farms Road that actually uh, discharges down into uh, a detention area that's further down on the eastern road. Uh, there is public sewer in the area. As a matter of fact, there is a sewer line uh, easement. It's about 20 feet wide that actually crosses this property. Uh, so the utilities are, uh, you can see the hydrant in the photo as well. Uh, so utilities are all available in the area. The development of this site would not require any additional infrastructure from a street perspective. Uh, all the sidewalks and the street frontage all exist currently. Uh, no expansion necessary for plowing, uh, the bus route, uh, trash pickup, any of those items that would all be right uh, in the existing active corridor with no need uh, for public expansion for that. <coughs> It, it is, it's tucked in behind yeah. the trees, you're correct. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So as you can see um, on the right photo in that uh, image, that mowed lawn is Dr. Kerr's lawn uh, in that area. So the property limits would be right where the, the grass starts uh, to be tall uh, in that location. So uh, as I mentioned, it is um, about a 1.6 acre site um, with the proposed uh, density, uh, we would be looking to mimic the R4A zoning district, which is the current zoning uh, in that area. Uh, so we would be looking at the potential for uh, four dwelling units per net residential area, uh, net residential acre. Uh, so for this particular lot, we'd be looking at a maximum available of five uh, dwelling units. We're proposing um, a layout that would have three house lots uh, on it. And if you sort of look at, I'm going to go back to the aerial for a moment. <coughs> if you look at the aerial photo, you can see that to uh, use this property as single family residential is quite consistent with the patterns of development in the overall area in that on the easterly side of Portland Farms Road, you've got primarily uh, single family residences and on the western side of uh, Portland Farms Road, you've got the multifamily. So uh, we're looking to um, what we feel is an appropriate use in that area that is consistent uh, with the surrounding uh, land uses that are already in that area. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Alyssa and I'm available if you have any questions. So I'll talk briefly about uh, what the proposal consists of. We've provided you with a, a draft for discussion purposes of uh, both the contract zone agreement uh, as well as a potential amendment to an agreement that it, uh, was entered into between the town and um, the, a bank who was the owner of the property back in 1992. Uh, and from our perspective, those would be the two legal requirements in order to move this application forward because this is, this is a bit unique in that the contract zoning agreement would not be the only required element um, of the approval. So I'll start with, um, generally speaking, the contract zoning agreement. As Nancy indicated, the proposal is to enable the development of the vacant lot, which is outlined in yellow, um, consistent with the underlying zoning requirements. And as I said earlier, because that vacant lot served to provide acreage to the condo development for net residential uh, density calculations, what that would re result in would be um, the condo development, the Risbera Clearview condominium lot would be too dense as it currently exists today. So the proposal that we've put forward is a contract zoning agreement that uh, in fact encompasses all of the property but really relates to the density in the condo development because what we're asking for on the vacant lot is in fact consistent with the underlying zone and, and no difference. So uh, if the, the council and the planning board uh, were inclined to move forward with a contract zoning agreement. Um, there's 
not necessarily a request to do anything different with the zoning of the vacant lot, provided that it does not have to serve as additional acreage for the Clearview condominium development. So what's left then is to address the density of the Clearview condominium development, and that's what our proposal in the contract zoning agreement does. Um, the understanding that there's a requirement of public benefit for a contract zoning agreement, what we have proposed is to provide um, an in lieu fee to the town for its affordable housing fund of $20,000 per unit to be developed on this lot um, as a public benefit. We see the potential housing there as a public benefit um, to the town, but uh, to add to that, uh, are proposing to also incur a fee and require that per the contract zoning agreement, which we, the, de the condo association, um, does not intend to build these on spec and undertake this project, but intends to sell the property to be built. So it is sort of incurring the obligation to ensure that that fee gets built by whoever uh, prepares, or excuse me, um, buys the property and then ultimately builds on the property. Um, in addition to the contract zoning agreement, so that's sort of the premise of, of what we're proposing, there was an agreement entered into, as I said, between the town uh, and Key Bank of Maine who owned the property uh, at one point in time, in this case in 1992, um, essentially took rights to the property in lieu of foreclosure. And when they took rights to the property, the property had been developed uh, with too many units per um, the current zoning at the time. So the town entered into an agreement with the bank that basically said this property will continue in its existence, will be determined to be legally, lawfully non-conforming, uh, provided that no additional development occurs on the property. Uh, so that's a limitation with respect to um, the Clearview condominium lot as we see it. The vacant lot, as I said, is part of that lot. So we see that as being subject to the 1992 agreement and that's something that needs to be discussed with respect to this application. Uh, and we think that if there if the contract zoning agreement is ultimately approved by these two bodies, that that, ag that agreement should be amended to address any potential title issues so that it's very clear um, that these lots are in fact not subject to that agreement to the extent that they were in 1992. Uh, so we've provided a proposed amendment, it's very straightforward, can certainly be discussed further, but we wanna be sure that, that these two boards understand that those are two requirements of this application that we're proposing. <laughs> I don't know, Nancy, if you have any other thoughts about the site plan itself that you wanted to discuss in terms of um, potential size or configuration. Uh, I just briefly add uh, to that, as I mentioned, we are looking at three single family lots. Uh, those lots all would uh, be of generally uniform uh, size. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is a 20 foot wide uh, sewer line easement that comes across the property. The common lot line in that area has been designed so that that easement actually sits within the side yard setbacks, uh, which would be 15 feet on either side. So it's well within uh, that quarter uh, so that that doesn't impose a restriction on any uh, development on the lots. The lots are generally a standard size and shape. There's nothing odd about them, if you will. Uh, they all have their frontage along uh, Portland Farms Road. So. Uh, it's a quite straightforward layout. As I mentioned, there's no proposed road improvements. There's no proposed uh, expansion of any of the uh, public utilities or infrastructure uh, associated with it, which is kind of unique. Uh, we don't usually do subdivisions where we don't have to, uh, you know, extend a road or do something along that. But this is uh, clearly something that's an infill uh, type development. It doesn't uh, expand the, the requirements on the municipality. So thank you. Matt has anything to add. I think that's um, the bulk of our presentation, so we'll defer to any questions or any other any other comments the board has. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and <clears throat> for the audience uh, watching, the uh, uh, zoning ordinance of Scarborough uh, has a uh, outlines a process by which contract zones are dealt with. It involves uh, a series of steps uh, at this public hearing. Uh, that's a joint hearing before the planning board and the town council. Uh, the uh, 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 second step in the process following the applicant's presentation is the comments from the town staff. And I would look to Jay Chase, the planning director, uh, for comments on 
from the planning board, or from the planning department. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. From from staff, um, it's all here around the table. Should have received uh, my memorandum that sort of spelled out. I think the issues, um, as were just articulated pretty well by the applicant, frankly. I mean, the, the, the genesis of the contract zone request is just as they stated, um, to allow for uh, density that wouldn't otherwise be allowed on this property um, and is inconsistent with the underlying zoning, and that hence is the <clears throat> reason for the need of the contract zone. So I think they did a pretty good job of spelling that out, and I'm certainly happy to answer any further questions. Um, but I won't sort of belabor that point. Um, I guess the only other thing I would just sort of mention is that, um, as you just uh, mentioned, uh, Chair Donovan, that as part of this process this evening, uh, ultimately after there's uh, further public comment and discussion between board and council, uh, ultimately this evening the council does take some action as to whether this item should, there's really sort of three, three sort of procedures that could could occur. The council, uh, I'll sort of read them as they're written in the ordinance. Uh, council advise the applicant to one, withdraw the request for contract zoning, two, to continue the process for request for contract zoning with or without modifications suggested by council, or three, to revise and resubmit application for contract zoning. Um, so those are really sort of the three options at the end of all the deliberation that will continue to happen. So again, I'm happy to answer questions as we go, but. And, uh, and we'll reserve questions for the discussion uh, period between the uh, town council and the planning board. The next step in the process is public comment. Now that the matter has been introduced, uh, and anyone wishing to uh, provide comment on this, please approach the podium, and you have our attention. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Pat Gould. I live at 31 Arborview Lane in Scarborough. Been there for 25 years. Been a Scarborough resident for over 30. Uh, we oppose this this um, um, this this um, proposed development. First of all, there's already a zoning issue uh, in play, a density issue. Um, it is the um, only open space in in this particular neighborhood. Uh, there's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people walking, you know, along the trail around the neighborhood. Um, I just don't think it's a, uh, the appropriate use for that land. I think the appropriate use, if you're going to do something with the land, is make it a park for your know, children, for elderly people, um, for the people who do use the Eastern Trail a lot. I think to try to build there, the, the Eastern Road, um, especially that particular leg from Eastern to Arbor View, is not in very good shape. It's not, it's not well paved. Um, we, we've had some pretty rough winters along the, the way there. Um, and there's been no proposal for any road improvement. Um, so I say, you know, maintain the quality of, of um, our neighborhood. Um, again, if you look around, there's not a lot of open space in that area. Um, and I think we need to maintain as that. And my proposal would be that the owners of the property make it a park or, or an open space that people can enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Others who might want to comment, please. Hi, my name is Kevin McDonald. I'm at one Judge Hasty Lane. It's the house that um, is at the top of the field. Um, so when I bought the house in 2000, 1998, moved into December, um, I had a, a document that talked about the association and can't have piles of wood, can't park outside, can't have a pole, can't burn wood. And there was also a statement in there that this discussion like this wouldn't occur until 2030. And then at that point, it would simply be discussed and would likely revert or continue in perpetuity. So I kind of don't know what happened to that concept. And I, I don't know, it's, it must have been a declaration in the original uh, establishment of the two associations. I'm not sure I wasn't there to do it. So I was kind of curious to know what happens. And I got this letter, and I think it was mailed on the 7th, so I would have got it a day or two later. So I don't know if I had time to dig into it. I have a job. So I didn't get to do any more research to sound all highfalutin, but to put 
three homes there. We've done quite a bit in that barb, and I've done a lot to that house. And uh, to have a house that's, you know, maybe looking into your backyard, I guess, I don't know. Maybe it's a NIMBY thing, but there was a proposal a couple of years ago to put a parking lot there for the Eastern Trail, and I think it was about money. It wasn't a, a great way to to uh, spend money in the town at the time. It wasn't worth doing. And having a parking lot in the backyard wasn't any better mm. than potential of five or eight con condo densities. I was kind of wondering this evening about this space in terms of adding to your bankroll, I guess. Um, you know, uh, a little bit south of the condos that are already there, there's a big chunk of land, and I don't know who owns what or, you know, that, is, that access is established to Portland Farms. Like you said, Portland Farms and Eastern Road are both in so-so condition. And so three new driveways entering in there, I, I, it seems a little odd in terms of the layout and the flow of that road. But uh, I'm not a civil engineer, but I was just wondering what happened to the declaration that said that this type of review wouldn't happen until 2030. When was a rule change? Was it changed after I bought my house in 1998? Or uh, uh, before or after? I, I don't know if anybody can answer that. I have to pay to get that answer. But um, I, I just kind of, I'm concerned that I might have spent money on my property lately that I could have done something else with in lieu of what it might look like to live there. You're right, the trees between the condos and Portland Farms Road have grown, but I have one tree that I put there. Technically, it's in what would be a buffer zone, so I don't have a curtain of trees or 20 years to get to that point. So, and I, I did hear mention of the town would get 20000 per lot, so that's the payoff, I guess. <laughs> but um, I was wondering if a piece of that would be available that I could buy. What's the, what, what is this piece of land? I guess I don't really understand it if um, they can come in with a proposal to build on it. Does that mean that it's, it's theirs? And uh, I guess I sort of understand they're wanting to build on it if it's there. But if there wasn't a density issue to begin with, mm -hmm. why? Uh, there was a density issue to begin with, and now... Isn't there still a density issue? Mm -hmm. What is a density issue? Maybe. So. so, a bunch of questions. I just I feel like it's. Um, I'm not trying to put the brakes on. I I think I'd rather um, just build another house somewhere. But I do want to find out if we we really have. All kidding aside, spent a lot of time and effort in the past two years with the house that you see at the top of that field, and. Uh, I think I don't. I don't know why Dr. Kayer isn't here because his tr the leaves fall off his trees, you know, and he's going to be in a similar bind visibility-wise. He's got a pool and everything, and he probably thinks that you know he's got a sweet deal there tucked in the woods. But <laughs> winter comes every year, and so again, I'm not really against development and progress, but I do want. My concept of when I bought the place, I was told as part of the sale that mm -hmm. this field, which has been mowed tw about twice a year, that's why it hasn't grown over, um, was going to stay that way and have a review again like this in 2030. And so I don't know what happened and wh why we're here. So I guess I'd like to know. Thank you. Your questions, I expect, will be addressed by those with a degree of knowledge. Uh, about this in the course of the discussion between the planning board and the town council. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak uh, on this matter as a part of the public hearing? Thank you. Mark O'Leary, uh, 35 Opa Bue Lane. I'm also an owner at uh, Clear Bue. Um, went to the meeting in April that we had. I am in favor even though my vote says no. Uh, in the condo selling the property to do the upgrades that they want to do. The only question I have is I think the number of units that can be built on this property needs to be defined before anything happens. Um, if I look at the $20,000 affordable housing number and it gets to be five, five uh, units, 
um, in selling that property, I don't think the condo association, the, the owners, can absorb that amount. So I, I don't know how we guarantee that. Uh, I am in, in favor of selling the property, though. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Close the uh, public hearing uh, here and move to the next step, which is the response or rebuttal from the applicant, if there's anything that the applicant wishes to add or address as a result of the public comment. calling on Matt to answer in part the question that was raised with respect to uh, the date of 2030 being a year that was promised to abutters. Um, I can at least say that from uh, my knowledge of the property with respect to the declaration of the Risbera Clearview Condominium Association, which again does not include any research related to the Clearview Condominium Association, which could be different, as well as the 1992 agreement that there is no reference to 20, the year 2030 or any other time frame with respect to future development. Um, as I said earlier, the 1992 agreement says that there will be no additional residential development, which is part of the challenge that we're presenting to you as part of this application. Um, but I'm not familiar with any specific time frame <coughs> in either of those documents related to this condo association. And I'll let Matt speak to whether he's aware of any others. I would agree with, my, again, I'm Matt Garrett. I'm the president of the Bridgebear Clearview Condominium Association. <coughs> uh, I agree with Alyssa. I've been a unit owner at uh, Bruce Bear Clearview for since 2006. Um, I've been the president of the board for seven or eight years, and uh, I am not aware of any timeline uh, when this property can be addressed for sale or anything regarding 2030 uh, at all in our bylaws or in our declaration. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure kind of where that number came from, um, but uh, that's. Well, I I guess my question would be whether it was a covenant on Judge Hasty Lane or whether it would, would have been a covenant in regard to our Excuse me. Uh, Thank you. All discussion should be directed through the chair. Okay. I'm so, I apologize. So, and I expect we'll have the ability to address that question further. But yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The next step in the process is a discussion among members of the Planning Board and the Town Council, which may include questions posed to the applicant staff and the public. And I'm going to recognize the Planning Board Chairman, Corey Fellows, uh, who is here tonight, and uh, ask if each of the Planning Board members would introduce themselves so that the public will know who's attending and part of this discussion. We do interest. Yes. First, before yes. we. Okay. Before we. So I'm Corey Fellows, chair of the planning board. I'm Susan Arbus, planning board member. Rachel Hendrickson, planning board member. Robin Saunders, planning board member. Uh, Richard DePerry, planning board member. Nick McGee, vice chairman. Thank you. Uh, and I think probably for purposes of discussion, we might just start by going around the table and getting a sense of people's viewpoint mm -hmm. on this so that. Uh, if you would like to. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> I should point out, oh dear. for those who may not be aware, this is Susan's last appearance oh. as, a, as a member of the planning board. So and, oh. and it's I only fitting. I think it's only fitting. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was hoping to go first. And Susan would first go first. First and last. So, uh, Susan Oglis, one of our <clears throat> longest standing members, a very respected member of the planning board. Well, according to Toady, it's been 18 years. <laughs> Tony swears that that's true. <laughs> I feel every day of it. <laughs> no, I don't want to make it sound like it's been a wonderful experience. And um, in that 20 years, a lot has changed in Scarborough. And most of it has been, in my view, very positive. But there's one thing that has always really, 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 really <laughs> bothered me. Shall I say really one more time? Sure. Contract zones. Mm -hmm. I really don't like contract zones. I swore to the uh, our, our uh, planning director that I would not say that at a planning board meeting again. Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so you bring it to me. <laughs> I mean, by bringing it here at this particular time. 
I'm not going to explain all the reasons why I really don't like contract zones, but what they're asking for is the number one reason that I really hate contract zones. It's like, it's the law, people. You sign the papers, it's the law. We gave them additional, we, the planning board, gave them additional bonuses mm -hmm. because they were not going to build on that land. It was open space. Whatever they used it for wasn't what mattered. What mattered was that there was a certain density that was allowed by the zoning ordinance, and they wanted greater density. So that was the trade-off, okay? I'm not sure I understand why they're asking for this. They want money? Is that what it is? I heard somebody say to do upgrades on Clearwater, or Clearview, or whatever it is. So. Perhaps they want to sell this land to create money to take care of their existing property that is developed. That's not what a contract zone is for, people. That particular piece of property, 1.6 acres, is, it's all kinds of things that could be used for. Certainly a park for kids. I always envisioned gardens with stone, you know, stone um, benches that the people could come out and wander around that they came off the Eastern Trail. There's all kinds of things that can be done with that property. But developing housing on that property, as far as I'm concerned, is essentially illegal no matter what we say. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah. Um, we have, the planning board has spent a fair amount of time dealing with um, conservation developments in which we, we really take a hard look at open space because we're concerned about overdevelopment. We are concerned about Scarborough losing some of that open space area. Uh, and to have a contract zone request that essentially is proposing to take the open space away from a condo development um, and turn it into more residential areas seems to me to fly in the face of what we've been doing on the planning board and what I think the, the town has been doing. Uh, I do think that Scarborough might want to take a look at its approach to infill development, because as um, I, I suspect this would not be the last such request that we might see, simply because as good developable land is, is taken, um, folks are going to start looking and saying, well, I have something here that can be developed, or perhaps I can move this and develop it. And I don't think we have really have a, a policy, and, and I, I object to development of policy by individual incidents as it goes along. It's too much flying by the, the seat of your pants, we'll do it this time, well then we'll do it the next time, and we'll do it the next time. They made a deal. Uh, I think that's a good open space that could be used by the condo association. Uh, if they want to give it to the town, I assume the town might be interested in talking to them. Um, but not to add to the density that's already over dense. Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah, I have three points, I think, um, for, for which I'd like to convey to the town council. Um, and the first one is that this is already lawfully non-conforming. Mm -hmm. And I, as a planning board member, it's my understanding that we want to have as many conforming properties as possible. So it appeals to sort of my charge as a planning board member in that sense. The second one is I'm not necessarily sure that all the easements, encumbrances, and covenants are properly shown on the lot, since um, uh, there's some, I think there's some, there's some mention when you go back to like, when you dig into things of a drainage easement and, and other sort of encumbrances and covenants that it was hard to, to, to figure out based on, on what we had. But in general, it, it sort of points to my third point, which is um, I'm not sure that the public benefit outweighs the, the public benefit of the existing property. Um, the, you know, I, I firmly believe that you know, contract zones can be a useful mechanism to receive what's an otherwise unattainable public benefit. But the public benefit that, that, that's there right now provides runoff and drainage management for downstream existing properties that could potentially have flood damage. Um, the, the site engineer said it herself that that current property is very well draining. 
which means that is a huge infiltration pack for upstream runoff that's coming down. So to, I guess, put downstream properties and also downstream water quality in, in the marsh and mudflats um, at, at, at risk uh, bothers me. And then lastly, I'd just like to say that I think it sets a poor precedent to move this forward um, on the planning board and town council level. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Robin didn't really leave a lot left for me. Oh, come on, Robin. You've got something. You know, my, my general philosophy as a planning board member is if you own a piece of land, you buy a piece of land in Scarborough, and you follow the rules, then you should be able to do what you want with your land. Um, in this particular case, uh, because of the concessions that were made when that development went in, the rules changed. And the rules aren't um, the rules aren't what they were when that all was one big vacant lot. So um, I'm not in favor of changing the contract zone to allow any development on that. Lot. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Um, colleagues said it very well so far. I right? first and foremost the uh, precedents it would set. Every time we get one of these developments that comes in, it says we're going to preserve X amount of land. I'm going to set it aside, and this will be there forever, and it's not going to be developed. And then to have um, something like this come forward based on what they probably perceive as a bit of an opportunity um, would undo what the planning board, the town, has already taken steps to preserve. And I think that's that's me most worrisome about the proposal. Um, and, and then I also... Um, I'll just say something about the public benefit. Yeah, there's a lot of criteria that could you could condition something as a public benefit. I think it should be also a face value test. Is is three new homes in Scarborough really a public benefit? And you could argue that maybe some of that tax base is part of it. Maybe some of the, you know, the enhancement to the other parts of the neighborhood. But one of the conditions in here is that the development, you know, one of the criteria that you guys could use to put this through would be. Um, basically to uh, preserve open space, which is the exact opposite of what this would do. So, I mean, I think just on its face, it just mm -hmm. it doesn't feel right. And if it doesn't feel right, then I think there's it's probably a bigger problem that, you know, I don't think it's worth a lot more time investigating. If you're overturning precedent, you're going to take away open space. It's just... <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, a great Thank you. Corey? Thanks. Um, yeah, I won't belabor it. I, I, I really agree with my colleagues. I agree that it's a, a potentially dangerous precedent that would um, potentially weaken the hand of the planning board and the town going forward. Because um, again, these, as, as Ms. Oglis described, this was an example, and, and this happens fairly often as projects are reviewed and approved, where there was um, you know, a deal, for lack of a better, mm -hmm. better way to put it, um, and if the expectation is not that the deal is effectively in perpetuity, then it really doesn't have as much weight. Um, and I should emphasize that um, I am not opposed to infill development or increased density per se. Um, you know, we, we do that in a way through the conservation subdivisions and in other cases where it's appropriate. Um, I'm also not, but I, I don't think this is the right vehicle for it. Um, I agree with Ms. Saunders that there are times when contract zones can be appropriate and useful, but I don't see the public benefit justifying um, this request. I also, am, am, as I, I'm sure my colleagues agree, I don't have any issue with property owners wanting to extract more value and make money, uh, but again, I don't think mm -hmm. this is the appropriate vehicle for it. Thank you. Uh, town Council members, let's start with Peter. No, I, they were so articulate, I don't think I can add much to the conversation, so I will defer the, to our colleagues. I think they have some sound reasoning. So in deference to Ms. Ogulis, I, I can say, as an elected official, that I do not like contract zones, Aww, thank you. Uh, and I don't have to worry about what staff thinks, um, so I concur with you 100%. Um, I don't think she's really all that worried about it. I know she was. <laughs> I was just being nice. Jay. Two lame I, I, ducks here. Yeah. I'm leaving. He's yeah. being nice yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, I, 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 I do want to give the applicant their, their due process. So I would be curious um, 
uh, through Councillor Rowan when his comments come around, if he could comment to uh, is 60,000 to, I, I'm assuming it's going to be limited to three lots, not five, but I, I would need to hear that for sure. Uh, yeah. If three lots and it's $20,000, what would $60,000 to the uh, affordable housing fund look like and what could that be used for? just for the sake of having that discussion. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitant moving forward. I, I personally don't see it, but I'd, I'd, I'd wait to hear from my colleague to see if that was a meaningful public benefit. Thank you. Councilor Kettery. Um, I'm going to be straightforward. This is a no for me, an absolute no. I don't think it needs to go any further. Um, the planning board has elucidated everything that I thought the minute I got this and started reading it. In 1992, uh, a, a deal was made to give increased density by putting aside this land, and that's it, folks. I mean, that's that's the deal. That's all she wrote. So uh, I don't want to see any change to this, but I want to start uh, precedence, and I don't like contract zones either, unless, unless there's a really good quid pro quo there for the town, and I don't see one here. But anyway, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Councilor Bayvine. So I have uh, some opinion, but I want to ask a couple questions. So, can Jay, can you answer the question about the 2030 date and where that might have come from? Do you know anything about uh, that? I haven't seen anything in the record about that. I am wondering if it is in maybe something related to the Judge Hastings subdivision provisions, which this property isn't part of. So, I, I can't speak okay. to it. So, the, the second question I have is um, so, you know, if you don't know where I live, I live at the intersection mm -hmm. of Summerfield Lane and Serenity. The next intersection up is Eastern Road, Portland Farms Road, and Serenity. So I'm literally about 50 yards. So I've lived there since 98 or 99. So there's also been, and so there's a lot of myths and rumors. And so I just want to clarify because everyone asked, and they blame me, they asked me. Um, so I had heard some time back that when the development that I live in, or, the, or it's part of it, um, there was some type of unitil accident um, on the marsh, the pipeline, gas pipeline, in which there had to be a reclamation and some soils had to be taken out of there and placed someplace else and new soil had to be brought in in order to stabilize the ecology. I was told, or at least the rumor is, is that that actually came from that land um, that's there at that corner, so they did the swap. So they took the good soils from that corner lot that we're talking about, moved it over into the marsh or whatever the area is and then kind of did the thing. Do you know if that's accurate? Is, um, is that why maybe the 2030 date is there because of the purification process or whatever you want to call that? So by way of benefit of a side conversation we had one right. day, I was able to do a little research. I asked actually at a department head meeting. We have a bunch of department heads who have been in town longer than the 11 years I have and sort of threw that on the table and they scratched their heads and, and weren't able to come up with anything and thought about it. And our town librarian actually went ahead and did a lot of research going into microfiche and we weren't able to sort of come up with, there, there's, People had recollection of a, of a unitil issue, but not of a soil the swap soil. at this property. Um, okay. I so. Had to ask. Yep. <laughs> you know, yeah, how, after 20 something years, they all. Um, so, you know, I, I want to say thanks to the planning board because you articulated very well. Um, by the way, I have no problem with the contract zone. I don't like contract zones in residential, um, for residential development when there is no. Um, significant benefit to the town and I don't think no matter how the $60,000 is going to be used for affordable housing that's the type of benefit that we're looking for when you're dealing with density um, as part of that um, I'm not usually uh, concerned about drainage but then of course I have a little bit of experience because it does come into because if that was developed actually if you go to Dr. Kerr's house in the next house over there is a significant retention pond um, in front or between the two houses and it actually goes under Dr. Kerr's um, driveway and um, when you have a really really bad storm if you actually go to my neighbor's house which is two doors from our two houses uh, from the corner um, he puts a boat out because it's so deep he's got such a big I'm, I'm totally serious um, so if there was more drainage I can't imagine what would happen so um, I can tell you no one in the neighborhood wants this Councilor Rowan thank you um, so you know there's a a 25-year-old agreement here that I that I, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to that they you know those people were thoughtful and were had foresight into to seeing that um, that this might come up and that they had made that agreement at the time with the expectation that it wasn't going to be overturned 25 years later. Um, the um, so I think that there's 
uh, a precedent here that I'd be really concerned about overturning. I think there's another precedent, though, that I'm that I am very concerned about, which is which is the idea that um, the town is willing to um, to trade uh, density um, in exchange for twenty thousand dollar contribution um, to the affordable housing fund. I'm a huge advocate of affordable housing. I think we need much more of it in town than we've been able to produce. Um, any time in, in recent history, uh, and uh, but the um, as we spoke or as I referenced the last time that we had a um, contract zone come before us, that that I'm really concerned that that dollar figure is is far too low. The the twenty thousand uh, dollar unit, you know, we have to leverage that money many times in order to be able to produce a unit of, of affordable housing, um, and um, the, we have a very healthy trust fund right now, um, and we're we're really working hard to figure out how to utilize that on, on the Scarborough Housing Alliance in a way that will produce that um, some some return for the town. We There has been some affordable units um, built in town. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, but I, And I'd, I'd love to see more, and I'd love to have more access to funds, but I, I don't feel um, that this is an appropriate way to uh, get, get access to those funds. Thank you. Councilor Poe? Um, so a lot of times in life you don't know if you don't ask, right? So I don't begrudge the applicant uh, for coming before us. They, you know, have something they want to accomplish. This was a, uh, an option for them to try to accomplish it. I don't think it's the right option for us as a town. Um, but so they asked, and, you know, I, I think we have a, a pretty clear and resounding no. Um, you know, I would say the one thing that the more persuasive argument for me to develop that land would be if they came in here and said, I will put four affordable houses there or I would put for senior housing options, because those are the two things in town that I see uh, a huge need for. Um, so, but even at that, uh, I, I also, I'm leery of contract zones. I, I do think there's a time and a place for them. I just don't think this is the time and place for this one. So, I do like the idea about park, though. Hmm. So. Uh, would anyone, before we conclude the discussion, would anyone like to add any further comments? Sorry, there, there was one further comment that I had. That if, if they were to if they were to resubmit, I think a, a one avenue that they might want to pursue would be around uh, the conservation land swap, and instead of affordable housing, in that you would buy conservation mm -hmm. somewhere else, preserved mm -hmm. forever. Well, I'm not saying I would I would still approve it. I might just be more more inclined. I'd like to respond to that. If that's okay. You may. The biggest problem to me is that the, is precedent setting. The mm -hmm. rest of it is all of that particular piece of property. Sure. But ultimately, as I said in my beginning remarks, this is the law. And we would be setting a precedent if we overturned it because we, we see them at the planning board a lot. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them out there. You know, I mean, I just, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. What would happen? I just don't think it's worth it. Point. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. But the precedent thing is what really gets me. Given the nature of the discussion, uh, I would accept a motion. Uh, we have three options. The council shall, by vote, advise the applicant, one, to withdraw the request for contract zoning, or two, continue to, uh, to process the request for contract zoning with or without modifications suggested by the council, or three, to revise and resubmit the application for contract zoning. Uh, Council Caterina. Yeah, I move that the applicant withdraw this request for contract zoning. Second. <coughs> Discussion. Councilor Garza. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear we're we're, we're all in agreement here. I, I and the only reason I would even uh, be so dismissive is I think it's pretty clear that I, I don't know what changes would be uh, possible to to certainly move this forward. I can't really think of even. Uh, a situation where I would consider uh, another application. I'd hate to waste their time, uh, at least from my perspective, as limited as that is. Uh, so I certainly would support a, a motion to withdraw. Councilor Bavon. Um, the reason why I support this is that even if it was to move forward, I would vote no when it came to back to the town council because um, I think Ms. Oglis spoke very eloquently about exactly why as well as everyone else. Other comments from council members? You ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? 
unanimous. I think it was a pretty clear direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You guys made it easy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Planning Board. Thank you for thank all you. your time. For, uh, for your it. insights. It was invaluable. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're so you 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 Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm not saying goodbye because oh, I'm going to see you this week. Oh, of course, you're going to see me all over the place. Just all the Planning Board. That's right. I'm not going. Who's
Uh, meeting of the Scarborough Town Council, and we are dealing with the next uh, public hearing. Uh, order 18-29, uh, public hearing on the proposed Fifth Amendment to Contract Zone 1, Frank R. Goodwin, ENF Limited Liability Company, and Raymond C. Field, Land Rover Dealership, located at 371 U.S. Route 1. Uh, I think this is simply a public hearing, therefore, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the planning director, mm -hmm. Jay Chase, to give us a rather brief summary of what this is before us for the benefit of the audience. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council. Um, as you noted, this is the public hearing as part of a contract zone amendment process uh, for the, um, forgive me, if, uh, the to get the property owner's name, but for the Land Rover dealership uh, here in, in town. Um, and ostensibly what they're seeking to do is to purchase an abutting piece of property and expand their parking uh, to meet the needs of their operation. Um, so it would incorporate that additional property into the pre-existing contract zone. Uh, as is already noted, this is the public hearing process. We've already had first hearing with council. The item has been before planning board and they uh, conducted their preliminary site plan review. Um, and I believe you've received comments from, from the planning board deliberation on that. Uh, subsequent to this public hearing, there will be a, a second reading and action on the contract zone agreement by this council. And then after that, as a final step, the uh, item goes back to planning board for final site plan review. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Uh, this is the 7 o'clock public hearing uh, on this contract zone proposal. Anyone wishing to address the, uh, the town council, please approach the podium. See no one, I will close the public hearing. Order 18-55, a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section Roman numeral 6, Definitions, Affordable Housing. And uh, we are having Council Rowan, introduce this matter? Yeah, sure. Um, so this came uh, to first reading several meetings ago. Uh, essentially, the, the Scarborough Housing Alliance is, is trying to provide clarity um, to definitions of um, affordable housing um, to make it easier for uh, individuals that are providing affordable housing uh, to be able to do so, to be able to market apartments um, and price them and figure out how to uh, qualify the uh, individuals that are allowed to um, uh, live there and meet the ordinance. So both for, this is both to apply for uh, renter-occupied uh, rental units uh, as well as owner-occupied. Um, so f to be able to um, price the market, put it on the, excuse me, price the, the home, put it on the market, and then figure out who can buy it and still qualify um, is uh, what this was intended for. Thank you. Uh, this is the public hearing on uh, a uh, zoning amendment. We have had a first reading. We will have a second reading at a later time. Any member of the public wishing to address uh, this uh, proposed order, please approach the podium. Public hearing is closed. Just if I could, uh, it's worth noting, the Planning Board did take the matter, this matter up this past Monday. They do have a number of questions. Uh, Housing Alliance meets tomorrow, I, uh, t a week from uh, tomorrow, I guess. Week from today. Week from today, I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, uh, and I certainly expect that they will uh, take up these questions by the planning board and have some responses back for council at second reading. Thank you. Uh, order 18-66, action on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I MRSA 4056C uh, and consultation with legal counsel relating to the proposed downs a credit enhancement agreement. Uh, uh, I would. Are you returning to the session or are we going out? From we will be uh, uh, concluding in the manager's conference room. We'll open the door and announce that we are concluding at that time. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Opposed? We are. Will roll call in. Thank you. Right. I get bonus. You should, I was just going to say, you should.